Therefore, it's time for members' statements. The member from Chatham, Kent, Essex. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. It's my pleasure to rise on behalf of the Ontario PC Caucus and my constituents to welcome representatives from the Police Association of Ontario who have joined us at the Legislature today and to reiterate our support to them and to their uh, patients. Absolutely. It was my pleasure to meet once again with PAO President Bruce Chapman and members from the Chatham Kent Police Services, Dave Miller and Joel Rehill. The Police Association is the voice of our province's frontline police personnel, comprised of over 18,000 police and civilian members of police services. The entire PC caucus believes that police officers must have the resources and tools to do their job safely and effectively to keep our communities and themselves safe. That's why on his first day in the legislature, Patrick Brown called on the government to pass an NDP bill to give PTSD support to first responders. The government eventually introduced their own PTSD bill, which we were happy to support. Now, the member for Halliburton Kawartha Lakes Brock has been a champion of ending human trafficking in Ontario and has worked alongside police to bring this issue to light. So let's support those who save us. I encourage members to meet with police officers and leaders from their ridings today. I would also like to invite members and their staff to come down to the reception that the Police Association is hosting tonight in the dining room. Thank you very much, Mr. Here, here. Speaker. Thank you for the member's statements. The member from Parkdale, High Park. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to confront the challenge that has been given as of November 8th to every person in every country where human rights are concerned. Pundits can spend years figuring out why Donald Trump was elected, or even if it was a legitimate election. Our concern should be what to do now that he has been elected. Certainly, the misogyny, racism, and queer phobia of his campaign have left many on the side of our border feeling vulnerable, frightened for the future, and wondering how to explain that future to our children. Might I humbly suggest that we begin by confronting our own systemic racism, where First Nations and all people of color are concerned? That that we examine our own policies and conduct regarding LGBTQ2S citizens, and that we continue the fight for women's equality, which means childcare, equal pay, and giving women an equal voice in government. Many since November 8th in our communities are feeling under attack. attack. Racist confrontations have increased. This House, of course, must always and ever condemn such actions. There is no doubt that now is the time to act and to speak out. This Sunday, for the first time, the trans flag will be raised over Queen's Park at 9 a.m. in honour of the Trans Day of Remembrance. Trans citizens experience more violence, suicide and poverty than any other marginalized community. On Monday, as we rise for a moment of silence before question period, might we reaffirm our commitment to stand strong for all those among us who, since November 8th, are even more in need of allies. All those who are in need of this House and all in it to be a beacon of hope. Thank you. Thank you. For your member statements, the member from Scarborough Southwest. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise today and bring special attention to a very important issue and a very special family that's living in my riding of Scarborough Southwest. With continuing conflict and unrest in the Middle East, Ontario took a leadership role in opening its doors and providing a safe new home for refugees. Mr. Speaker, people across the world view Ontario as a place of opportunity, of prosperity, and of unwavering inclusiveness. I've been fortunate to get to know such people over this past year, and I got to meet um, uh, a husband and wife just uh, a few months ago, Mr. Agardis Sahagin and his wife Lucy Aposian, both from Aleppo, Syria, came to Ontario at the beginning of 2016 with their four children. The family was sponsored by the Armenian Community Centre in Scarborough, and they've since made incredible strides starting their new lives here in this province. I've spoken with this family on several occasions, and it's impossible to fully express how grateful and lucky they feel to call Ontario and Scarborough Southwest their home, to have a fresh start and a chance to fulfill their dreams. Too often, it seems, we lose perspective of the human cost of the horrible conflicts going on around the world. Um, when I asked the, uh, the husband and wife, well, how's Aleppo these days, and they said, there is no more Aleppo. And getting to know this family hasn't just been an excellent reminder of that, but also the openness, generosity, and compassion for others that makes Ontario great. 
and I hope that we will continue to welcome families like these into our province and into our ridings. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further members' statements. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, and good afternoon, Speaker. Uh, November is Financial Literacy Month, and I would like to take a moment to highlight its importance. Financial literacy is among the most essential life skills for all Ontarians to have. Having a firm grasp on personal finance is needed to manage debt responsibly, to make smart decisions, and to lead a secure and fulfilling life. Last month, I had the pleasure of visiting Woodafield Secondary School and Chippewa Secondary School with uh, Alterna Savings. Here is something I learned that day. Being even one day late with your credit card payment, Speaker, is a black mark on your uh, credit score for seven years, and that makes it more expensive to borrow money for a car for your home. Knowing how to save and how to spend responsibly directly influences one's success. With that in mind, it is concerning that a recent investor education fund survey found that only 25 per cent of students feel they know enough about money to make smart spending decisions. Problem. It is important that we focus on financial literacy for Ontarians beyond one month a year. That is why I'm introducing the Financial Literacy for Students Act to ensure every student in Ontario will graduate with the necessary financial literacy skills to live a fulfilling and successful life. I hope we can continue to work and educate young Ontarians on such an important matter, not only as the students today, but also as the decision makers of the future. Here, here. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Kenora Rainy River. Today, I would like to draw attention to the health care situation in the Northwest, described as being in dismal crisis by a Kenora physician. Over the past several weeks, I have heard from physicians, nurses, and patients in Kenora who describe health policies that are failing Northerners. I have heard about the antiquated Lake of the Woods Hospital that has parts still in use today that were built shortly after the First World War and whose surgical room has tiles falling from the walls. I have heard horrific true stories about Kenora patients who, in an effort to free up limited hospital beds, are discharged from hospital to look after themselves until they die but who have such advanced dementia that they lack the capacity to do so. And I've heard from a Kenora man who received a $1,600 hotel bill after being sent the five-and-a-half-hour trip to Thunder Bay for emergency health care rather than the much closer two-and-a-half-hour trip to Winnipeg where they could stay with family. These stories are not one-offs. They are very much representative of the health care challenges people living in the Northwest, in particular Kenora, have to face on a regular basis. All Ontarians, regardless of postal code, deserve health care that is close to home. We are calling on this government to fix the health care deficit that exists by allowing patients west of Thunder Bay to be seen in Manitoba and by constructing a new state-of-the-art and fully functional hospital in Kenora. Thank you. Thank you for your member statements. The member from Beaches, East York. Great member. Well, thanks, Speaker. A recent uh, great local newspaper inside Toronto recently published a story about the progress our government is making in improving the lives of new immigrants to Ontario. As Joanne Lavoie wrote, six low-income neighbourhoods in the east end of Toronto, including Beaches East York, are benefiting from $130,000 in provincial funding to settlement projects. And this is part of a larger $22.2 million investment over the next two years in 117 settlement projects and 98 settlement agencies across the province. The government initiative, the Newcomer Settlement Program, helps immigrants and refugees find housing, obtain schooling for their children, receive work, language training supports, and connect with their new communities. Wow. The NSP fosters a seamless transition of newcomers to Ontario through the provision of community-based settlement and integration supports, delivering a suite of services to meet their diverse needs. In Beaches, East York, Costi Immigration Services will be using the funding to build on a previous pilot program that was focusing on employment. So funding is provided for direct delivery of settlement and integration services, including services tailored to the needs of vulnerable newcomer groups, such as the many Bangladeshi women and the initiatives that build sector capacity and promote service innovation. So, Speaker, I believe it's especially important in these times for us to acknowledge the openness and the welcome that has been provided by so many Ontarians to newcomers. I know in Beaches East York, we enjoy a broad range of backgrounds from new and long-time Canadians who ensure that everyone feels at home. Thank you, Costi Immigration Services, for all the great work you do. 
It's the member from Dufferin Caledon. Thank you, Speaker. I want to share concerns about the ongoing delays in the review of the GTA West Corridor, which impacts residents in my riding of Dufferin Caledon and across the GTA. Rather than moving the project towards a decision and giving affected residents more information on the future of their community, the minister has decided to strike a panel to discuss alternatives. This is after taking the unprecedented move of suspending work on an environmental assessment of the proposed highway. I want to share a letter from a constituent of mine that they have sent to the GTA West Corridor panel. They write, quote, we are writing you as an agricultural family that is currently the largest feedlot operator in the region of Peel. It is very disappointing to note that the terms of reference noted in your webpage make no reference to impact on the agriculture and your task force doesn't appear to have any representation from the agricultural industry. The long process to decide hinders our expansion plans, prohibits investment decisions, causing us to make short-term more expensive investment decisions, and prevents intergenerational planning. The ministry, by failing to make a decision in a timely manner, is negatively impacting agricultural operations in the area, an industry we thought the Liberal government wanted to yeah. see grow. Speaker, landowners have to have their land frozen with no indication of the future of their land for almost 10 years now. It's time for the minister to make a decision that will impact millions of Ontarians and residents in my riding. Thank you. Thank you. For the member's statements, the member from Kitchener and Waterloo. Thank you. Like many, I find the result of last week's election to be deeply disturbing. It was a historic election, but not in a way that shattered glass ceilings or furthered our goals of building safe, inclusive communities where everyone has the ability to reach their potential. I had the responsibility of speaking to a first-year gender studies class at Wilfrid Laurier University the morning after the election. I encouraged the students to find their voice, embrace a cause, and actively challenge the language of hatred and fear that not only exists south of the border, but in our country and in our province as well. Our feminism, our fight for equality, and our activism are now more important than ever. Programs like the University of Waterloo's He for She campaign are working towards gender equity. The Waterloo Aboriginal Education Centre runs a STEM camp for girls where they are encouraged to reach their potential. And they should be ambitious. We need to ask ourselves, what can we do about this new world order where sexist views have been rewarded, where races have been empowered? In my view, we must learn to be good allies. We must refuse to be silent and complicit when people are expressing racist and sexist views. We need to empower the young women in our lives to achieve their dreams, dreams as big as the presidency. To, the, to my girls' government group at Our Lady Lords Public School, we have a lot of work to do, and we must remember that we are stronger together. We must hold the line and challenge the status quo. We must support the vulnerable. We must challenge hatred and discrimination in all of its forms, and we will honour this work with purpose and with courage. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. For the member statements, the member from Ottawa. Stop. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, I would like to echo the comments made by the member from Parkdale High Park. You know, we just saw in Ottawa yesterday the defacing of a rabbi's home in the Glebe, and we saw posters around Toronto. And you know, my own riding of Ottawa South last year, a mosque was defaced, and a centre that many of my constituents go to uh, was defaced as well. So, you know, that the discourse south of the border that's gone on over the last number of months is deeply disturbing. And it seems to say to people, it's okay to have these attitudes. It's okay to hate. It's okay to mock. And it's not okay. we're not immune. We are not immune. Don't believe we are immune. Because we've seen shadows of it in the last federal election. We see shadows of it in a leadership race. We see shadows of it in our community. So, as legislators, as people who have a responsibility of leadership in our communities and in this province, we all have to speak out against that. It is not acceptable. That's right. Canada and Ontario is a place of the we, not the me, and I encourage all members to stand up in their community for that basic principle. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Good morning, President of the Treasury Board. Yes, thank you, Speaker. I have a message from the Honourable Elizabeth Dowdswell, the left hand signed by her own hand. Eyes, please.
The Lieutenant Governor transmits supplementary estimates of certain sums required in service to the province for the year ending 31st of March 2017 and recommends them to the Legislative Assembly. Toronto, 16th November 2015. Elizabeth Dowdwell, Lieutenant Governor. members for their statements.